Okay, so let's now take a look at a second game, again with Vishiana and with the white pieces. This time he opens with the move 1, e4. So black responds with e5, and white plays knight f3, immediately attacking the pawn on e5, so black plays d6. Not as popular of a move as, say, knight to c6, for, you know, a couple of reasons, one of them, of course, being that this bishop gets locked in. White now plays bishop to c4, and black plays knight to d7. White plays d4, and now black plays c6, which is quite a common idea in these openings, simply to gain control of that potentially important square on d5, and sometimes support a advance of the pawns on the queen side. But black has to be very careful in these lines, because after the move d takes e5, already there is a possibility for black to go seriously wrong. If he plays the move knight takes e5 here, white would respond with knight takes e5, and now black would have only one move to stay in the game, so to speak, and that is queen a5 check, taking advantage of the exposed e1 to a5 diagonal, and after a move like knight to c3, black is able to collect this knight on e5. Having said that, white could continue with a move like f4, and again, we notice first black played the check, second move in a row where he moved his queen, and now third move in a row, he's got to move his queen because it's being attacked by the f-pawn. So let's say queen to a5. Now white could play a move like bishop to d2, eyeing up that queen, and black would probably have to move the queen, and now white would simply castle. And the, the position is very, very good for white because he has developed all of his minor pieces and he has good central control, and his king has already castled. So all of the key principles are there. Whereas for black, his king is still in the middle of the board, and all of his minor pieces are still undeveloped. And why is that? Well, because he made a lot of pawn moves, and then the remainder were a lot of queen moves. So this is something that black should avoid. But let's rewind and ask ourselves why it is that black had to play this check on a5 to recover the knight. Well, the reason is because after d takes e5, there is a strong tactic for white that basically wins on the spot. After d takes e5, the problem is that if we look at development, we see that the queens, the d file has opened up, and the queens are simply in a kind of a reciprocal relationship here, right? They're both eyeing each other up on the d file. Same can be said for the pawns here on e4 and e5. It's kind of symmetrical. But the symmetry ends there because white has better development. Notice that black has pushed this pawn to c6, whereas white has spent his time bringing out his light squared bishop. White is also one move away from castling kingside, whereas black still has his minor pieces blocking that. So from the point of view of king safety, this is very problematic. However, it's really this extra developed piece that leads to a tactic. White here has the move bishop takes f7 with check. Now, the idea is that after king takes f7, well, white simply picks up the queen on d8 and it's game over. So black actually would have to play the move king to e7 to avoid losing his queen, but he is down a pawn and his king is unable to castle in the future and it's on e7, which is a very... A vulnerable square and blocks the bishop. So the position at the club level, sometimes black will be able to recover and win the game. But at, say, grandmaster level, this would just be considered a losing position for black. So this is something that really needs to be avoided. Now, I want to show one thing, which is, let's imagine a situation where, in this position, rather than black's position being entirely hopeless, if black had one minor piece developed that this knight on g8 was on f6, for example, let's imagine a situation where the knight is on f6 and white pawn is on h3, something like this. Well, in this case, the situation would still be okay for white, but it would be a lot less good because black would have bishop to b4 with check and a discovered attack on the queen. So notice the way that development can even make the difference between a tactic being just completely winning and crushing or a tactic having a, a suitable defense, a suitable tactical response. So always keep that in mind. 
Anyway, the game did not proceed in this way after d takes e5, black simply captured back with the pawn, what was correct to do. But Anand here could castle, right? Very, very simple, logical, complete your development, bring your king to safety. But instead, Anand was aware of what black wanted to do. Well, he wants, black wants to develop his minor pieces and then castle. But black is behind in development because his minor pieces are still there, whereas white's kingside minor pieces, they've both been moved from g1 and from f1. So white uses this to his advantage and combines this bishop that was on f1, but is now pressing on f7, with this knight that was on f1, but now has the possibility to jump to g5. And he plays this move and he uses those two developed minor pieces to pressure black's f7 point. And now black had to respond with the move knight h6, because that's the only way to defend this pawn on f7. And what's very interesting about this is that even though black has actually made a developing move, the thing is this knight on h6 is not a very good piece. It's not a very well-placed piece. As they say in chess expression, which many of you may be familiar with is a knight on the rim is dim, right? So in this case, sometimes there are exceptions, but in this case, it absolutely isn't an exception. This knight on h6 is nowhere near as, as well placed as if it was on a more central square. Now, where did the knight want to go? Let's imagine here, white didn't play knight g5, but instead played a move like castle. So black would probably have played bishop to e7. And now let's say that white makes standard mechanical developing moves. Now black plays the move knight to f6. And let's say white plays, I don't know, let's say queen to e2. Well, black simply castles. Now black has completed his development in a very harmonious way. He's brought his knight out to a central square from which it eyes up the e4 pawn and even eyes up that d5 square. And the knight is simply just well placed there. On h6, it would have been a target some moves like bishop takes h6, ruining the black pawn structure, but on f6, it's perfectly safe. So Anand, of course, is not going to allow his opponent to do that. Instead, he takes one moment, one move, rather than completing his development, he focuses on his opponent's plans of developing and he hinders those. By attacking the f7 point, it's not that it cannot be defended, but it is that the only way it can be defended is by developing a black piece onto a bad square. And that's another point, which is that development is not as simple as getting your pieces out from their starting squares. It is get your pieces out from their starting squares onto good squares. You don't want to get your pieces out onto bad squares. But that is not something we should focus on too much other than, you know, take a look at what happens here with this knight. White plays the move castle, and now black plays the move bishop to e7. So he's completed his development in a certain fashion, right? But notice how in the ideal scenario, the knight would have been on f6. But in this scenario, the knight is on h6, and we said that in some situations, it can be targeted. Now, Anand creatively exploits this particular idea and plays the brilliant move, knight to e6, which must have been a bolt from the blue for his opponent. Now, the knight is very simply attacking the black queen and creating a second attack on the pawn on g7. So the knight must be taken, because if, let's say, black plays queen b6, now I take this pawn on g7 with check. The king must move, and no matter where it goes, my next move is going to be to take this knight on h6. So I've won a pawn and a knight, and it's game over. And we see it's that same knight that was on that vulnerable bad square of h6. Therefore, black simply captured the knight, and now we see Anand's idea. Again, bishop takes knight on h6, exploiting the vulnerable position of the knight. Now, if black captures then white plays queen to h5 check. Now king has to step to f8, and bishop takes e6, with a devastating threat of checkmate on f7. And we see once again the development issue coming into play here. White's two pieces are incredibly aggressively posted 
And so even though he's actually down a piece, Black has no way of dealing with this checkmating threat. The only way that Black can cover the f7 square is queen e8, but he kind of smothers his king, similar to the example that we looked at, but with different pieces here. Now the e8 square is gone from the king, so queen takes h6 is checkmate. The bishop and the queen combine beautifully to finish the game. So, Anand's opponent presumably saw this and instead played the move knight to b6. Now, Anand is facing one concern, and that is that the bishop is being attacked on c4, and the other bishop is being attacked on h6. But he saw this, and he played queen h5 check, which is a very clever resource. Now, the idea is that if black plays the move g6, as he did in the game, white now drops the queen back to e2, and the bishop is no longer being attacked, because white goaded his opponent into pushing that pawn to g6. So now the queen on e2 is defending the bishop on c4, and we see that the position is, is simply close to winning for white because the bishop on h6 prevents black from completing his development. We see once again hindering your opponent to finishing his own development. And on top of that, it's not a topic we're focusing on right now, but the pawn structure is very bad for black. However, the question is, well, could black have played differently? Some move like king to f8, and now you have that double attack, and perhaps it's impossible for white to defend both pieces. Well, in this case, white would have an amazing move. He doesn't drop this bishop back or drop this other bishop back, you know, pick between which bishop to save. He does not do that. Instead, he focuses on development as well as on king safety, in this case, the lack of king safety of his opponent, and he plays the move f4. And we see, again, this is very similar to the idea of opening up the a file in a previous game that we looked at, or opening up the h file in the game that we looked at before that. In this case, the rook on f1 is x-raying that king on f8. And what to do? Well, no matter which bishop black grabs, let's imagine that he grabs the bishop on h6, f takes e5 with check, and we see that that rook coming into play is just game over for black, because if he goes to g7 or to g8, then white will respond with queen f7 checkmate, and if he has to play bishop to f6, well, you know, simply rook takes f6, and again, king e7 will be met by queen f7 checkmate. The only way that black can continue is by sacrificing even more material and, of course, that is just entirely hopeless. Let's consider what might happen if knight takes bishop. Well, in that case, the same thing, f takes e5. If king to g8, queen f7 is made. And if bishop to f6, well, again, rook takes f6. And we see how that development has turned into a fierce attack. And g takes f6 is not an option because of this diagonal, right? The pawn is being pinned by the bishop. So again, if the king goes to e7 or to g8, queen f7 is checkmate. So the only way black can continue the game is by taking here, but needless to say, this is hopeless, and indeed it's going to be forced checkmate very, very soon. So f4 is simply crushing move. Now, there is nothing to be done. White simply is going to take on e5, and black has no time to capture either bishop. So after queen h5 check, black played the move instead g6, which was a very, very smart idea. I mean, if king to d7, that was the alternative, rook d1 check, and we see serious problems here along the d file. Bishop d6 would have to be played. Now white can take here on g7, give up this bishop on c4, and now amazingly just play a simple developing move, knight a3, hitting this knight, and let's imagine knight takes a3, in this case, queen f7 check. Beautiful move. The purpose of this move was to connect both rooks, and on top of that, remove the knight from its defensive duties. And so here, after queen goes to e7, white has a crushing tactic. Rook takes d6, king takes d6, and rook d1 check. The king must step away, 
either to c7 or c5 and next move the queen is falling so that just shows the dangers that are present for for black if he plays the move king to d7 so wisely black chose to move g6 white went queen to e2 black chopped off on c4 queen takes c4 bishop f6 and white simply played knight d2 completing his development notice knight d2 is a smarter move than knight to c3 the reason for this is because again all of these moves can be considered to be a developing move but as we said development is not only about bringing out your pieces it's about bringing them out to the best squares possible and if the knight goes to c3 well it looks good but where is it going to go to next all of these squares are covered however if the knight goes to d2 in the future that knight can go to f3 to b3 or if the queen moves even to c4 and these are all much much more attractive squares so after knight to d2 black goes queen to d4 queen b3 white is not interested in exchanging queens b5 rook a to d1 by the way i should say the reason why white is not interested in exchanging the queens is twofold number one is because after queen takes queen e takes d4 the structure would have improved right black is no longer having these doubled pawns and the second reason uh, just as important is the fact that black still has the king in the center of the board white has his king safely tucked away and so much much better to play a move like queen b3 keep the queens on the board and maintain good attacking chances because if it's the black king that is less safe then with more firepower on the board which king is going to feel more uncomfortable clearly it is going to be the black king so queen b3 black played the move b5 just to prevent this idea that we already talked about knight c4 and in the future maybe moves like knight d6 b5 but what's the problem with this well pawn pushing when you're behind in development white played rook a to d1 the queen went to c5 white played queen f3 simply hitting that bishop on f6 notice the way white's moves come in with tempo because rook a to d1 was x-raying the queen so black felt the need to move the queen away and now queen f3 is hitting that bishop on f6 and again black has the need to protect that bishop and now after knight to b3 anand's opponent was so horrified by his position that he simply resigned because the problem is black has a bad pawn structure and has a lot of weaknesses especially here on c5 in some situations the bishop may maneuver or even the knight and then the d file is firmly under white's control the f file is being influenced by the queen and black cannot challenge for the f file because of the unfortunate placement of that bishop on h6 for him and he cannot complete his development either he cannot bring his king to a safe square he cannot develop this bishop very well because well all of these pawns here are blocking its way so white's play was so clever with this beautiful idea early on of knight to e6 let's take a look at that here this first of all knight g5 was a very very nice idea hampering black's development and then that led to this tactical stroke knight e6 with that double attack on g7 and, and d6 so black had to capture and then after bishop takes h6 well fast forward a few moves and black is left with this bad pawn structure and an inability to castle because of the bishop on h6 so a few moves later on move 17 in this position black realized that there was nothing to do no good way of finishing his development we can illustrate this very briefly let's imagine black played a move like a5 now white would simply double up the rooks there is no, nothing to be done i mean what can we think about let's play a move like bishop to b7 so white plays rook to d1 and now white's thread is simply rook to d7 so actually here black would have to drop the bishop back to cover that square so let's consider 
Instead, maybe black chooses a move like rook a7. White still goes rook f to d1. And now if black plays rook d7, for example, well, white chops off that pawn on a5. So let's imagine first a4. Well, in this case, white jumps into c5. You might be asking to yourself, well, can I not simply take that knight? Well, if queen takes knight, queen takes f6, and this bishop is no longer defended, and white has devastating threats to capture the rook and to give checkmate on d8. So after knight c5, black would have to play something else, maybe rook to g8 first. And now here, white can continue in many, many ways, but even just a simple move like bishop to e3. The harmony of his position is incredible, and the threat is, in some situations, going to be knight takes e6 and bishop takes rook. There are many, many ways that white can convert this position into a win. For now, you guys can either analyze it independently or take my word for it, but I hope that you found this game and the previous game by Bishiana and former world champion, truly one of the all-time greats of the game. I hope you found these games enjoyable and instructive and keep in mind the takeaways. Development is not just about bringing out your pieces, but it's about bringing them out to good squares. And it's also not just about developing your own pieces, but it's also about making it challenging for your opponent to successfully complete his own development. So that's it for me on the topic of development. And now let's turn our focus to king safety considerations. I'll see you there.